So this is, uh, uh, you know, I usually give my uh, regular Julia talk, but this is actually slightly different and the talk that I not done so much of before. This is about uh, building, you know, an open source community and uh, our experience is doing that. So I'm hoping as part of this talk, you know, you'll hear something that's different. I do have a little Eclipse uh, related thing uh, as well, so it won't be a completely uh, unrelated talk. Uh, but I'm going to introduce, you know, a little bit about what Julia is and you know why we started uh, building it and how we got to where we have and where we are planning to go from there. I would suggest uh, strongly that you interrupt me with questions as I'm speaking so that we can make this a little interactive um, rather than me just giving this monologue. All right, so um, how many people here have heard of Julia before Naresh introduced it? Okay. Fantastic. This is, you know, at least the proportion of hands going up is increasing with every uh, conference now. <laughs> That's a good thing, right? Um, so, you know, we started this project back in uh, 2009, and uh, it was Jeff Bezanson, Stefan Karpinski, and myself uh, who were the three original authors of the, all the Julia code, and then Professor Alan Edelman at MIT, uh, whose research group anchored the project. Um, it, al it always started from day one as a real open source project under the MIT license. Um, although, of course, just like many other open source projects, no one ever knew about its existence until, you know, it kind of uh, got a couple of, uh, uh, you know, it kind of went around on, on some blogs and stuff. So actually, I, I think I should show you that uh, that blog post just, just for fun. And here we outline why we started, why we created Julia, you know, it was, uh, there was one. There was one very easy answer. Uh, it's because we are greedy. And uh, you know what? What does greed translate in, into for a programming language? So what we were thinking was, you know, we want the power of MATLAB. We want all the flexibility of Lisp. Uh, let me let me pick up some choice phrases here. So, you know, the dynamism of Ruby. Is this readable? Maybe I should make it a little bigger. Huh? Yeah. Okay. You know, so we had the dynamism of Ruby, uh, macros like Lisp, you know, st uh, stats like R, general programming like Python, string processing like Perl, linear algebra like MATLAB. So at, at first glance, when someone tells you something like, oh, we are creating this new language, and by the way, it's going to have all these new features, uh, which are the best of all these things, it sounds like you're just taking a whole bunch of things and putting it, uh, you know, in a mixer and just and making a good uh, milkshake out of it or something. Um, and uh, that would have been the case for us as well, but luckily by the time this blog post came out, we had been working on Julia for three years, and there was actually, uh, you know, you could download the repo, compile Julia, and uh, decide for yourself if Julia was on the path to meeting some of these goals or not. And even uh, in 2012, when, uh, you know, it started getting some real traction, um, the language had uh, taken shape, and it was beginning to, meet some of these promises. What happened with this blog post was it was a little funny and tongue-in-cheek, and uh, it's not very long, actually. I urge you to read it if you're curious about Julia. I, I think we got everything right except, you know, it's time for a 1.0 release. Uh, that's what we thought we were close to in 2012. Here we are in 2016, uh, not yet having released 1.0. In fact, we are releasing 0.5 in the next couple of weeks. We do expect that 1.0 will be next year. Um, at the next JuliaCon. And then this, this blog post got carried all over the place. It was on Reddit, Hacker News, Lambda, The Ultimate, you know, all these, uh, you know, blogs and uh, aggregators that are wildly read. So it went from being a project with three contributors to a, a project with almost 30 contributors overnight. In, and in the first month, I think we had quite a mass of people uh, who were contributing. And some of those early contributors that we attracted actually continue to be some of our core contributors even today. And you know, just, just, just to give you a little bit of background on the kind of the community we've attracted, I think that Julia's been uh, one of a kind when it comes to this, uh, uh, you know, to, to a numerical scientific community. We've had people come in from various different domains. We've had people come in from computer science who are compiler people. We've had people who've come in from the numerical side who are like professors in universities, you know, teaching, uh, you know, writing all kinds of mathematical software. A good example is, um, you know, is, uh, 
is, is Professor Stephen Johnson from, from MIT, who's the author of the FFTW library that if you're a scientific computing person, you might have heard of. Um, or, um, or Professor Tim Holy, who's the author of a lot of our array processing, um, and who's actually uh, not a traditional computer scientist. He's, uh, he's a neuroscientist. Uh, a lot of our contributions have come from the brain and cognitive sciences people at MIT, or uh, embedded computing people at Berkeley, or mechanical engineers. So we've had this, you know, uh, while Julia is a language and it's, you know, it's great for a number of reasons that I think are, are important, I think what makes it a lot more interesting than its language design or the packages or the ecosystem or is its community. That it's a platform where all these different people who've otherwise not come together before have now come together and are shaping up something that's, you know, that's, that's new and innovative and, and different. The very first time, you know, if, if before I started work on Julia, if you told me that I can have a language that's got two major features, is highly productive so that I can write, you know, almost, I can use it almost like a scripting language, and is also very high performance, like, you know, C or Fortran or Java. So can I have something that's the speed of C, Fortran, and Java with the productivity of, you know, Python or MATLAB? And we were all programmed, you know, when we went to school, college, or wherever we learned programming, or you know, the the, the prevailing uh, wisdom was that this is impossible. You've got to pick either a scripting language and and enjoy writing programs, or you've got to pick um, you know a systems language and enjoy running programs. But but you can't do both in the same package. And uh, Julia, I think, was one of the first that was uh, that broke away from that mold. And uh, and here's uh, you know. I'm going to talk a little bit about how it did that and why. So here's our standard uh, benchmarks. Uh, I, I won't, you know, the purpose is not to try and convince you that Julia is the fastest language. You can convince yourself by downloading it and trying it out. But you know, this is a log scale uh, graph with uh, the ratio of the programming language on the x-axis with C. So if a particular implementation in a particular language was as fast as C, you know, that dot would be right here on, on 10 to the power zero. So right, this is the line where the ratio is one. And the benchmarks are really, really simple. Mandelbrot set, parsing a string into an integer, computing the sum of pi, quicksort, some random matrix stuff. And the point is not to write the fastest program using that particular language. So the idea is not to write a vectorized implementation in MATLAB or a NumPy implementation in Python, but to actually you know, stress test the compiler or the interpreter, to stress test the language. And, uh, and that's how these codes have been written. A lot has been talked about these things online, but if you look at it, Julia's the one with all of these things bunched up as close to you know, this x-axis uh, line that corresponds to, the, you know, to, a, to a ratio being as fast as C. Um, Fortran, even Fortran doesn't do well because of, you know, it's not that good at uh, at string processing, right? Um, and then Go was designed for a different purpose, does well, but there's, uh, you know, on matrix arithmetic, it's not doing well. Java is doing pretty good. Um, in this particular one, it's the complex numbers uh, benchmark that it's not doing well on, on the Mandelbrot set. Um, on, and even the Pi sum, this is the arithmetic one. Um, JavaScript, impressive that they've, you know, the compilers are so good now. Um, so this is this is one right. This is a factor of ten right here. So within a factor of ten, and that's ten thousand. So you got octave. The parsing a string into an integer in octave is ten thousand times uh, slower uh, than than C. So this is this is what sort of you know this community has been able to put together, and uh, you know, and this this is this is uh, this is what I find uh, fascinating about this this story. Uh, personally, myself. If you want to learn a little bit more about Julia, you know, go to the Julia Lang website, julialang.org, and um, you know, we're we need a better website. Let me let me say that um, this is not the best introduction that one can imagine. But these are some of the language features um, that we have. Um, I'm gonna just point out a few of them. So, multiple dispatch is. Is, is, is everyone familiar with multiple dispatch? Maybe in this audience people are, I see some yeses and some noes. Okay, very quickly, multiple dispatch is, I, I like to think of it as a, a, some kind of an uh, extension to object-oriented programming where 
instead of dispatching on the type of the object, you dispatch on all the types of all the input arguments uh, to a function. Um, and, and I'm not going to delve into that right now, but ap apart from that, it's got a great dynamic type system, Lisp-like macros, you can call C, Java, C++, Python, MATLAB, just about any language you want from Julia. Um, it's got coroutines, lightweight threading. It's, it's got distributed uh, processing built into the language. Um, amazing uh, specialization, um, that, that's an outcome of multiple dispatch. And, and a bunch of other stuff. It's open source, it's MIT licensed. And uh, oh yeah, good support for Unicode. I gotta show you this Unicode stuff. I just, it, it makes for great demos. So I'm just, uh, this is how, this is the easiest way to start using Julia is just, just fire up uh, you know, a REPL prompt and, and type away in it. So you got that and then this is the Unicode support. So if I type slash alpha just as in LaTeX and hit tab, I get alpha and then I can as assign it a value and then I can do stuff like. So mathematical notation, people love it because you can, write, you can translate your code from the papers directly into uh, Julia. So, you, you know, all these features actually came about, you know, over time, right? So, so the Unicode support, yeah, Unicode was always there, but, you know, the command line completion, the LaTeX-like strings, all that stuff came together as more and more scientific computing people started joining the Julia community, and then there was a long discussion on GitHub, and, and it all came about. In fact, this was, uh, the, the thing that made Julia a lot of, a lot, you know, if I, if I look back at it, right, the three of us who started out the Julia project, Jeff, Stefan, and myself, and, and uh, um, sorry, the four of us, including Professor Edelman, we all span different um, uh, disciplines, right? So we had pure and applied mathematics, all the way to compiler design to, you know, people who did scientific computing, such as myself. So we had all these different, um, and Stefan represented a bit of the systems view. So all of these people came together and, and started, uh, you know, this project. And as the project has grown, each of these kinds of people, each of these different kinds of domains have got representation. And that leads to things like, you know, what I showed you, like, like the Unicode symbols in the, in the editors or in the REPL. So yeah, it's great, it's got good performance. You know, we have this thing called Julia Box, which runs online. And uh, uh, let, let me actually just show a code right here. So this is a, you know, if you wanted to load a simple data set, this is the New York housing data set. It's a CSV file, you can look at it. You can make plots out of it. You can make different kinds of plots with different kinds of colors for different data points, um, histograms. This is all running on a server on, yeah, on, on Google Cloud right now, and I'm just running it inside my browser. So this is, you know, this is yet another uh, kind of tooling that has come on top of Julia. There's nothing Julia specific, but it's Julia Box integrates Julia and all its packages and, and, and does a great job um, running it online. But what other applications, uh, you know, what, what are the motivating uses of Julia, right? That's what you might figure, like how did this, this all come together? Here's, you know, so this is a very data science-y kind of thing. You know, you can imagine running regressions on this thing and machine learning and figuring out who lives where and so on and so forth. Um, here's a, let me see if, all right, so this is, uh, this is the Berkeley Autonomous Race Car. This was, uh, this is running Julia on this little car. So the car's like about this big actually. It's, uh, it's an open source, open project of some kind. Um, I don't know what you call open hardware projects. Do you call them open source still or you call them open hardware? I'd say this is an open hardware project. So it's running a little arm board on that car itself which is running Julia and doing real time optimization to do path planning. So you know it needs to know exactly when to slam the brakes so that it can uh, slide into that uh, parallel parking spot right there. So I'm gonna just run it once more and shut it off. So this is a you know completely different use case from the data science use case that I showed, right? So this is this was uh, optimization in real time. Here's here's another use case uh, that you know motivates uh, a lot of uh, things in Julia. Um, this is a project called Celeste. Uh, it's actually a project from UC Berkeley and the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and uh, 
what it's doing is it's using the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey, which is hundreds of terabytes of astronomical scans, and it is using machine learning uh, to label every um, object in the every object that's visible in this in these telescopic scans. Um, it's expected that it will take one of the biggest machines on the planet, one of the biggest supercomputers, several days to process this whole thing. And uh, that's what's going to happen sometime next year. Um, this project is waiting for Intel's next generation night's landing processor to be installed in the supercomputer at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and then to get enough time scheduled so that it can run on the whole thing. But in the meantime, we are trying to make Julia work you know, in multi with multi-threading and scale it up and um, all kinds of performance issues um, that wouldn't have come up unless someone was pushing it at this scale. So I think you're, you know, you might see a pattern, right? Like the housing data set, uh, the housing data set showed, you know, the standard kind of statistical modeling that you might want to do as you slice, and, you know, slice and dice data. Um, you had a, I had an embedded use case where you're Julia running on that self-driving car, or you know, you have this thing uh, like Celeste, which is, um, you know, which is, uh, which is sort of, you know, mapping the sky. And there are, you know, uh, there are tons and tons of different applications like this. We have applications in genetics, people doing amazing stuff, uh, people doing amazing stuff in, um, in mathematical modeling for drug interactions. Uh, you name it, that kind of research is probably already happening in Julia. And each of these domains has come out, you know, has, has happened over time, right? So embedded computing uh, only happened because um, you know, some of us got together and started porting Julia to ARM a couple of years ago. And then we started putting out some of the first binaries. And then others saw those things and were like, oh, wow, this is the best way to do optimization. I don't want to go and write all this code using GLPK or IPopt or all these other solvers, which have pretty horrific interfaces, programming interfaces. But the Julia interface is great. All right, it exists. Let's take it, put it on. And then the feedback loop starts. As, as you would know in any other software, right? That once users start using it, you learn what needs to be done and you start putting it together. How much more time do I have? Okay. So these, these were the different kinds of use cases that, that got different communities together who would not otherwise have been in the same community. I think you see this a lot in Python, where the scientific community, um, it's the scientific community um, and the numerical community in Python interact through projects like NumPy or Pandas, but not with the core Python language. And uh, that's something that I think in Julia we've been able to do better than, than most other languages, is, is we've been able to get all the computer science people and the domain people on the same platform. And that's the message I kind of keep repeating. All our development is on GitHub, and you know we've had 500 contributors so far, and um, uh, it's, uh, it's it's a pretty active project. If I if I just go and look at, you know, my notifications for Julia, uh, I you know there have been eight more issues updated in the last hour or so. So you know issues, pull requests, all kinds of stuff. Um, I think uh, you know folks from the Eclipse Foundation out here. You guys, uh, I was talking to Mike over the break, and it's like fifty thousand, hundred thousand, something like that. Doesn't even matter anymore. Yeah, it's 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 an it's a couple of order, orders of magnitude different. But for us, you know, main, managing a programming language with uh, 500 contributors already is kind of, you know, uh, stressing us to the point that we keep having to invent uh, newer processes. So, you know, we never used to have documentation. Uh, you know, before 2012, we never had test cases. Um, you know, contributions started coming in. You know, continuous integration came in. Test frameworks got written. Documentation systems got written and rewritten and rewritten. Um, at least a couple of times by now, um, so I think these kinds of you know are the growing pangs of uh, are the pangs of growth for a new language. Something like JUnit that you might take for granted in Java needs to be, you know, reimagined in Julia from scratch. And you know, it's I think only in the next release of Julia 0.6 are we going to be ready with what is going to be our next generation test framework, which is uh, you know going to be the second one now. Um, so. So that's, uh, you know, that's on our development processes. It's, uh, you know, a, a lot's going on there. A lot of people have now taken on, you know, testing and documentation as ownership within the community, and, and they're just focusing on that, which is a great outcome. Um, over and above that, we actually wrote a package manager, which, uh, which is uh, completely based on Git. So you could have a Git repository anywhere and register the URL 
in our metadata and then that gets you a registered Julia package. And we are at 1,091 registered packages as of today over the, this happened over the last three years. And um, I'd just like to show this. Um, so this is, you know, this is the last uh, three years of our package growth from 300 packages to 1,000. Uh, you can see that as new releases come, you know, support for old things kind of drops off and, uh, and new things, you know, new packages only support the latest version of Julia as you'd expect. And, uh, you know, these are all the new packages that came out in the last couple of weeks. So a lot of active development. Um, while it's focused on numerical and scientific things, there's all kinds of things you, that you'll see in here. Um, all right, so to end with this, you know, the last thing on the community side is JuliaCon. We, you know, one of the things that started happening was that in 2014, a couple of guys in Chicago came together and said, hey, we." we think there should be enough demand to have a little JuliaCon and, and let's get everyone together. And that's how the first JuliaCon happened in Chicago at the University of Chicago campus. And then um, we've done it twice since, uh, thrice since then, once in Bangalore and twice at MIT. And uh, it's now up to 250 people and uh, all the videos are online. We actually had a Nobel laureate. Um, this was the poster that we had. So we had a Nobel laureate, uh, Thomas Sargent, uh, who came and uh, gave the keynote speech in Julia. And uh, he's actually a Julia user himself at, you know, he's, he's actually started, uh, he actually codes in Julia and he learned it at, you know, at, at his age, which is really amazing. And um, he was actually telling me that I met this 25 year old who was telling me, oh, I, I only know Python and I'd never learned Julia. And he said, if I could learn this at 70, why, why can't you learn it at 25? Uh, and so that was, uh, you know, that was uh, very exciting for us to hear. Um, by the way, that's another domain, uh, um, macroeconomics, that's taking on to Julia in a big way. Uh, the New York Fed is using it for building models of the U.S. economy. Uh, some, some researchers at the Bank of England are using it. Folks at various banks and insurance companies are using it to model risk. So these are all various kinds of use cases that would not have been possible. Oh, this, is, this is our poster. So we had Guy Steele come and talk, uh, talk to us about the Fortress design. So it was, it was a lot of fun, uh, the last JuliaCon. And, uh, we think it's going to keep scaling and keep getting better. The next one is likely to be on the west coast of the US. So either one of the universities, maybe Berkeley or Stanford, wherever we can find uh, a cheap space. I guess that's the driver of all these things. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to stop right here and uh, maybe take a couple of questions. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, do, do download it and try it out. It's, it's a single download, no hassle. Oh, sorry, one more thing. I forgot uh, to get to the last point here, are the Eclipse connection. So Julia DT is our um, you know, developer toolkit for Eclipse. And uh, this, is a, this is an open source project. Um, it's out there. And uh, this provides uh, Julia support in Eclipse. It does all the basic syntax highlighting and stuff. And it also integrates the Julia REPL. Um, if you have it, it will find it on your computer. Or you can point it there. It will it'll load it up and then you can highlight code in the Eclipse window and, and sort of execute it um, you know, in the REPL and, and play around with it interactively. Um, if there are questions, I'll take them, or I'll just try to see if I can get a couple of screenshots of this stuff. Um, we, uh, a lot of our ideas come up on, uh, on the mail. It, they used to be on the Julia Dev mailing list, but nowadays it's been mainly on GitHub issues. So what we do is uh, when someone comes up with an idea, we, we call this thing as Julep, which is kind of like pep in some sense, uh, like the Python stuff. And uh, the idea is to write these up formally and put them in a single place. Um, we, haven't done a, we haven't done a great job with it yet, but starting with the next release, we are going to put the first Julep in its, op in its own repository and start making a little bit more of an RFC process. So we're going to do that with our package manager revision now, and that's going to kickstart the process. Uh, we've kind of stuck with the uh, loose time bound being about 9 to 12 months so far. 
We'd like to get to six months like the LLVM project. Uh, a lot of people in the community have been asking for time bound, but it's uh, very difficult, has been very difficult so far because of our dependencies on LLVM and a number of other projects. Um, the interactions are quite complex and uh, sometimes issues just take far too long to resolve. Um, I, I do hope we'll get to like a six month release cycle after 1.0. Um, we have a user manual which is uh, quite comprehensive, but we don't, we do not have, uh, for example, a formal definition of the grammar of the language. Um, most of these languages, uh, uh, this comes as a shock to most tool developers that we do not have this. And uh, the person who wrote the Eclipse plugin had to struggle quite a bit to even get basic things to work in Eclipse, which otherwise would be straightforward to get working. The challenge here is that for a mathematically oriented language, there is a lot of burden on the syntax. You don't have enough kinds of brackets, for example, to, to represent everything. You don't get enough kinds of operators, enough characters. So if you look at Julia's operators, I don't know how to get the whole list. Um, we actually provide the user not just the usual operators the, you know, that are in the ASCII set, but probably several dozens of Unicode characters. So you can have the set union or the set intersection or the big cup or the small cup or, you know, any, everything you can imagine. So this places a lot of stress on the on the tooling and the grammar, uh, for example, of the language. It's not been able, we've not put in effort to um, put it out there. Even um, our parsers actually is, is, a, is a little scheme program, um, which is, you know, which very tightly interprets the Julia grammar and uh, uh, white space ends up meaning too many different things than I would personally like, but that's just, uh, by the way, this problem is not just in Julia. It's 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 common across all languages of this kind, and uh, you know that's that's just how it is. I think I think we need to try and just come up with better tooling on our side. Right. Absolutely. I, I and and many people have brought this up, but. You know, it's just open source community and driving it, and there's too many demands. So over time, um, the language becomes the spec instead of the other way around, unfortunately. Um, that, that said, the compiler is actually small enough uh, that it's, it fits within 10,000 lines of C. Um, and the base library is probably 30,000 lines of Julia, but that includes the whole mathematical library, right? So matrices, arrays, decompositions, all that stuff. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, Eclipse? No, I haven't heard of it, but you know, I've been speaking with Oh, the Eclipse Science, sorry, I thought Eclipse Science, so I wasn't, yeah, okay. Yeah, Julia is part of the NumFocus Foundation at the moment, which is which houses a number of other numerical software, and yes, that's how we got started, no, you know, no other reason. I, I met Mike, uh, uh, Naresh introduced me to Mike only, I think, uh, last year and we were already in the NumFocus Foundation by then. But, but we would like to collaborate very closely with the Science Working Group. All right, thank you.